everyone, I am Jennifer Niem, University Researcher of the Mycological Herbarium of the UPLB Museum of Natural History, and I will be your MC for today's webinar. Thank you for taking time to join us today for the MNH Quincentennial Commemorations webinar series Balik Tanaw, Kasaysayan at Kalikasan with the topic 500 Years of Ornithological Explorations in the Philippines. To start our today's um, session, let us all welcome our MNH Director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, to give her welcome remarks. A pleasant good morning to each and everyone. I would like to welcome you all to UPLB Museum of Natural History's Quincentennial Commemoration 10-part webinar series. The UPLB MNH Ang Pilipinas sa loob ng limang siglo features online webinar series and virtual exhibits focusing on a theme, Balik Tanaw, Kasaysayan, at Kalikasan. The 10-part webinar series will give us the chronicles and highlights in the Philippines' natural history for the past 500 years and gaps and opportunities for research on the diverse Philippine flora and fauna. Let this also be a venue for collaborative initiatives for researchers, taxonomists, naturalists, and hobbyists to come together to promote and contribute to the natural sciences and biodiversity conservation. Last May 17, the UPLB launched its commemoration as part of the UP system-wide year-long event with the theme, Gahong sa Buot, Tindig at Pamana ng Bayan. This was made possible through the initiatives of the UPLB Ad Hoc Committee led by the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Community Affairs, Office of the Public Relations, Information Technology Center, the Office of the Initiatives in Culture and the Arts, and of course, the UPLB Museum of Natural History. We were honored by the presence and inspiring messages given by no less than the UPLB's Chancellor, Dr. Jose V. Camacho Jr., and Vice President for Public Affairs and Chair of the UP Quincentennial Commemoration, Vice President Elena Pernia. The launching was followed by the opening of the UPLB MNH 10 part webinar series. We had two interesting topics given by two great speakers. Adobo at iba pa, How the Ocean Shaped Our Culture by Dr. Laura David of the Marine Science Institute of UP Diliman and Past to Present, a historical look on coral reef complexity by UPLB MNH very own curator, Dr. Victor Dixon. It was attended by almost 300 participants, both in the Zoom and FB Live. For those who missed the interesting presentation and enlightening discussions by Dr. Lau and Dr. Vick, you can still watch the presentations by visiting the MNH YouTube channel. For today's webinar, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Juan Carlos P. Gonzalez and Mr. Christian Perez, who will bring with us the 500 years of ornithological explorations in the Philippines. I will let our moderator and MNH curator, Dr. Leticia Akwang, to further introduce our two great bird enthusiasts. I am, I am sure, just like me, you are all excited and looking forward to the picturesque and diverse avifaunal history in the Philippines. On behalf of the MNH Local Organizing Committee Chair, Mr. Florante Cruz, and co-chair Mr. Alvin Fajardo and the MNH curators and staff, allow me to again welcome you all and greet you a pleasant morning and here to wish you a safe and meaningful day ahead. 
Thank you very much. And back to you, Dr. Jen. Thank you, Director De Leon. Now I will be giving the floor to the moderator for today's session, Dr. Leticia E. F. Wang, our esteemed curator for herpetofauna at the UPLB Museum of Natural History. Pleasant day for all of us. A cool morning, a cool day, full of rain, but of course, it's it gives us a good um, relief from the hot from the hot sun. For today, before I introduce our special guests, I would like to remind you of the following house rules. First, make sure that your audio is on mute and your video is turned off. Practice uh, good weather etiquette. And second, please use the Zoom webinar Q&A feature to send questions. For those who are watching on our YouTube stream, just put your questions in the comments area and our technical assistant will copy your questions to the Zoom Q&A. All right, let me have the pleasure of introducing a good friend and a new friend, um, Dr. Juan Carlos Gonzalez and Mr. Christian Perez. Dr. Juan Carlos Gonzalez is already familiar to most of us. He is Professor 11 of, the zoolog of Zoology at the Institute of Biological Sciences and a former director of the UPLB Museum of Natural History, as well as curator for birds. He previously headed this from 2015 to 2021. Dr. Gonzalez is a highly regarded zoologist with significant contributions to natural history research, biodiversity conservation education, and the promotion of ornithological studies and evaluation of threatened species being a member of the Philippine Red List Committee. His monumental work on the origin and evolution of hornbills of the world has led to a better understanding of their taxonomy, distribution, and status. He is a multi-awarded scientist. Dr. Gonzalez's extensive work in the Philippine wildlife has brought him numerous local and international awards, including the 28, uh, 2008 Ford Foundation International Fellowship, 2011 NAST Outstanding Young Scientist Award for Zoology, and the 2019 UPLBAA Outstanding UPLB Alumnus for Biodiversity Education and Research. A recipient of nine international paper awards and four professorial chair awards, our speaker has been appointed as a UP scientist in 2014 and 2019. He has completed nearly 100 publications, uh, include, which include scientific papers, book chapters, reviews, technical articles, and both printed and online. He has been involved with the national programs of DENR, DABFAR, and DOST, which has engaged him as the expert speaker and resource person for numerous seminars workshops and training on biodiversity surveys and wildlife identification. You may also find him a familiar face on TV and radio. He has guested in over 30 radio TV programs and even hosted the TV show Explorer on Studio 23. Dr. Gonzalez got his uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Zoology in 2012 from St. Anne's College, University of Oxford, United Kingdom and his master's and B.S. zoology degrees from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos in 1997 and 1992 respectively. His partner for his talk, Mr. Christian Perez, is originally from France. Christian has been a resident of Manila for about 45 years. He must have loved our country. He has been drawn here by the birds. Uh, he worked for most of these years at the Asian Development Bank. He has been an active member of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines for over 12 years and a member of its Records Committee and Rarities Committee. In recent years, Christian wrote a series of articles for the club newsletter entitled A Short History of Philippine Bird Books that, that covered publications describing or illustrating Philippine birds from the 17th century to the present. Look at the uh, bird figures behind him. Those are part of that. Friends, 
I'm really glad and I'm so proud. I give to you the floor. I give the floor to Dr. Gonzalez and Mr. Christian Perez. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Okwang, for a splendid and heartwarming introduction. So as mentioned, we are going to talk about 500 years of ornithological exploration in the Philippines. And this is a tandem talk between myself and of course, Christian Perez. So the tandem talk will be, we'll switch between the different slides as we, as we go through uh, the presentation. Of course, again, I am JC Gonzalez and I will start with the presentation and then later on, I will switch it to Christian for the next segment of our talks. So our, the outline of our talk will include about 10 parts, uh, the introduction, um, um, the, the early Spanish colonial period, uh, the French publishers in the 18th century, noteworthy birds from the Spanish colonial period, uh, visiting collectors and expedition on the second half of the 19th century, the time of the Ilustrados and the Aleras catalog of the Museo de Historia de Natural, early American administration and the birth of the Bureau of Science, Japanese exploration and post-war birth of the National Museum, and collaborative expeditions, of course, noting uh, Dr. Abord, the father of Philippine wildlife conservation, and ending it with Philippine ornithology in the new millennia. To start off, the introduction will cover kind of a background on why we chose the 500 years of um, ornithological studies in the Philippines. So as part of the Philippine Quisentiel commemoration, uh, it's all anchored on the circumnavigation, which of course represents exploration, and the victory or valor of Bactan, which promotes the ideals and struggles of heroes. The University of the Philippines celebration also is guided by the, the theme, Gahum Sabuot, which means knowledge and self hope pertaining to local awareness, and notably about our natural history. And of course, about the state of the art of the Philippine heritage on ornithology. We also follow the, the museum theme, Balik Tanaw Sa Kasaysayan ng Kalikasan Sa Pilipinas Sa Loob ng Limang Siglo, or 500 years. So it's, it is an enumeration of bird records from 1521 exactly to 2021, highlighting significant discoveries and publications in the development of Philippine ornithology. And again, this Tampton doc presents a chronological count of those contributions, explorers, collectors, museum expeditions, and of course, ending with the modern day naturalists. Again, this talk was inspired from a series of online articles on the history of Philippine ornithological literature, of course, by Christian Paris, on the official newsletter of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines, Ebon. And again, if you want to go through the details of it, please go through that um, website as shown here on ebonwordpress.com uh, on a series of three years, 2014, 2015, both on the history of Philippine bird books and the history corner. Of course, we added in historical literature covering the second millennium, which then enumerates contributions during the paradigm shifts of Philippine mythology up to the third millennium by the new explorers. It culminates with, of course, the current status of modern avian systematics, and of course, the value of citizen science. So the first history that Lester will have is on the early Spanish colonial period from the arrival in 1521 to the mid 18th century. Okay, 1521, the course was marked by the arrival of Magellan and was first documented by Antonio Picafeta. So the account of that expedition, the first voyage around the world, um, noted several species of birds, including fighting cocks, which were raised by people of the islands of Paragua, Padawan, Chipot, Padawan, and in Pumunu. And most of these uh, actually took care of those fighting cocks and they did not eat them and venerate them because they used them for gambling. Chicken was of course called Monok, still the same name, Manok in Cebu. Cock fighting was a great diversion among the Malay people. And it's considered to be an advanced form for Asiatic Islanders because gambling uh, promotes wealth. However, the bird that they use refers to the jungle cock, caught and chained by large numbers by the natives, often recrossing them with the wild, the wild form with the domestic fowl. And often this, and this actually refers to the red jungle fowl or gallus gallus. If you go through the, the whole passage of the voyage, there actually is not about just the Philippines. It, it refers to other areas that they pass along, and of course mentioned other uh, birds not found in the Philippines, such as the jigger, the spoonbill, and the storm petrels. 
another entry in Pigafetta um, is about the island of Katigan. Um, it's actually quite contested whether this is actually Limasama or one of the islands in Camotes. But it actually takes note that it's a lot, there's a lot of birds on this island, pigeons, doves, turtles, parrots, and blackbirds. Blackbirds which are large as chickens and have a long tail and eggs as big as goose, goose eggs, and which they bury a good cubit deep under the sun, under the sand in the sun, which warms the egg and of course incubates them. So they actually deserve, these blackbirds refer to the tabun or the mound building megaphones. Um, as noted in Cuvier, the plumage is black. It's also called tabon in Manila, and its spouse uh, has eggs as, as, as big as that of a goose. Um, the tabon or Philippine megapode do nest in mounds and loose sand or soil, dug down about more than 50 centimeters. And when the, the chick hatches, they actually emerge unassisted from the sand. As shown here, the Philippine megapode. Another species that was noted by Pigafetta was a mystery bird from Cebu. So from another um, translation in Magellan's voyage, um, there was an excerpt that says, every night there was a black bird as large as a crow, and usually they come, began to screech so that the dogs would begin to howl, and the screeching and howling would last for five to six hours. And the people would never tell us the reason of it. So they actually were very fear, fearful of the call of this bird. It's actually taken as an expert from a blog called Mystery Blackbird from Cebu uh, by Clark 2021. It rules out the crow, of course, because it's used as a comparison, but Adrian Conrad actually suggested that it was the Asian poel or the kuhao, which is known to loudly call up to midnight. The myth persists in Bohol, which was featured in Capuzo Mo Jessica Soho. And actually, uh, Lisa Pakutalan described uh, the bird to be the quad to be similar to the crow, and that locals would describe the nocturnal switching call to invoke the reaction of the dogs. And people feared it because it represents a bad omen. And it is indeed the Bahau or the Asian poel because it matches all the calls and the coloration. So there you go that Picafet has noted several species during their voyage um, in 1521. Next in our history is in 1668, which illustrates the bursts first bird list made by Father Alzina. Uh, Father Alzina is a historian and Jesuit missionary in Manila, who is then assigned in the Visayas, Samar, Leyte, and Cebu. Uh, during his time in the Visayas, he wrote a manuscript called Historia de las Islas de Indios Visayas, which actually comes in two parts, one about the natural history of the islands and the other about supernatural and ecclesiastical. However, the original text was lost Fortunately, it was copied by Juan Bautista Munoz and kept in uh, the Royal Academy in Madrid. However, and later was found and was published by Victoria Yepes in 1996, 350 years later. So again, it was illustrated, but not fully published until 1996 and contains sketches of plants and animals uh, in two plates. Um, two plates represent five birds, each with the captions handwritten in Spanish. This includes those two um, plates as shown. You have the barn owls, uh, which doesn't actually look like a barn owl, but again, uh, lechuza is Spanish for barn owl. Um, talabongs, which represents herons or egrets. Again, there's no color, so you can't tell. But there is a bird called the tabon, which again was also found by Pigatepa earlier, and the banog or the hawk, which probably represents the Bermuda. Again, the drawings are not very clear to help identify it, but it's the beginnings of a bird list and a bird illustration that shows there is a record of natural history on the islands. In 702, there is the first published bird list. So this was a manuscript was created that was done in 1702, actually published in 1702. So this was done by George Ross of Camel uh, on the listings called Observationones de Abibus Filipidus. Um, so pardon my pronunciation. It was communicated by Jacob Petiver. So actually it wasn't Camel who published it. It was Jacob Petiver who got the manuscript and then published it in the Philosophical uh, Transactions in 1702. It actually counts 71 species of birds, mostly from Luzon, uh, all written in Latin. Um, described in uh, 
as from local names to Latin names. However, these are not yet scientific names since it was published before Linnaeus in 735. Um, some local names, as we noticed, did not change after 300, 400 years. Uh, Labuyo, Abukai, which means uh, cockatoo, Maya, Layang Layang, Papan, which means uh, Philippine duck. So it hasn't changed much in 300 years. Some of the key species that noted here was the Saris crane, which was called Tipul or Tibol in Luzon, or Goose or Grula, which is Spanish. However, the translation was actually off. You see Google Translate, it says three inches tall, which is actually a two meter bird, um, taller than human as seen in the photo. So the same manuscript was um, used by a uh, petty burr and he recatalogued that and had drawings of the specimen that was brought into England. So that actually represents the first published description of the specimen by Camel, and then the first ecological notes of that particular bird from the wild. It actually refers to the Kalau or the Rufus Hornbill. So there was notes on diet that it ate Baliti, Pidi, and Colette. There's also a very good description of the bird, um, the, sh the size of the, uh, the kaput or the crown, the rostrum or the beak. And then it, it also shows some illustrated specimens uh, published by Petit Burr in Opera Historia Batorelem, Spentasia, um, in 1767. It also takes into account a catalog, listing it as Aves Filipensis, Galea Plana Calao Luzumensis. And you see here, uh, drawings of the bill of the hornbill and the full uh, extent of the body uh, with the wings extended. So again, first published description of the specimen and ecological notes from the wild. In 1680, there was a, a manuscript which represents the first ethnological, ethno-ornithological account. So this is taken from a manuscript that was published in Philippine Islands, volume 47. Uh, written by Domingo Perez in 1680 uh, on about the people of Western Luzon called the Zambales. So the Zambales um, had all good and bad omens about birds, including one which is the Salaksak, which we, I think represents the, um, the white-throated, brown-throated um, kingfisher, which is a riverine bird with a red beak and feet with feathers green and blue. We also describe a smaller uh, kingfisher called the Pasimanequen. And then usually I can't tell what the toko is, but it is chacon in Spanish. Also noted about crows uh, being an omen uh, as it announces death at night. If you look at the, um, the map of um, Pedro Murillo Velade, which is a famous map called the mother of all Philippine maps uh, that was published in 1734, one of the 12 illustrations that covers around the map uh, particularly one from Luzon, shows a bird called the Cuervo Blanco or the white raven. And it actually is a bit unusual because we have that notion na pag puti ng uwak, pag ng So here in the start of 1734, there is actually a, a bird that was referred to as a white raven. Of course, we can't tell what species it is at the moment, but it might be something different as because of the description. But it represents the first bird illustrated in the Philippine map. Okay, at the onset of um, a, a taxonomy, we of, of course started with the a formal description of all the species by Carolus Linnaeus, when he used uh, and started the binomial nomenclature um, from 72 to 758. And I think it was the catalyst that encouraged a lot of exploration uh, on the East try, for the Europeans to do the expeditions and describe a lot of new species from the East. And it is a uh, catalyst that in 1735, the first birds from the Philippines were described by Carl Linnaeus from specimens that already brought into Europe. Um, Christian actually listed this in, the, uh, in, in his article that includes about 97 birds um, known from the checklist. And that includes uh, migrants, of course, species you find in Europe and the Philippines, Mallard, shoveler, gargany, osprey. And then you have also these widespread resident species like the green and pale pigeon, the goel, the dollar bird, 
um, the hill myna, and of course the black knife oreo. However, it includes about five endemic and near endemic species. The rufous hornbill, the blue nape parrot, the coletto, the purple throated sunbird, and the balikas shell. And it shows an excerpt of that particular description by Carl Linnaeus uh, on the bottom of shown in A, a uh, photo, of course, of the Balikas shell and the excerpt that says named Corvus Balikasius. So Balikasius is placed under cor uh, the family of uh, crows, um, habitat from the Philippines. Then you have the first set of Spanish, of, so a lot of expeditions went into the Philippines, but the actual Spanish expedition um, officially sent by Spain, authorized by King Carlos III, was in 1792. This includes the La Expedición de Nueva Espina, which is a five-year expedition that goes around the world, most of the, through the Pacific, from Tierra del Fuego to Alaska, to Manila, to New Zealand, of course, to Tonga. The Nueva Espina expedition described about 1,200 plants and about 500 animals across three continents. Uh, Alejandro, Ale, Alexandro Nueva Espina arrived in Samar at Cape Espirito Santo in 1792, together with three naturalists, um, which of course helped collect those specimens uh, around the country. Um, one of these uh, collectors, which actually is a botanist, Luis Ni, nee, collected about 57 birds from the Bicol Peninsula alongside his 4,000 plants, mostly uh, going through from uh, Laguna to Sorsogon. Um, I did not get any um, documents indicating which species were collected, but there was one publication uh, of a bird that was um, uh, drawn were sketched by one of the naturalists, uh, Tadeo Hanke, um, which shows a rail Galerado, similar to that of our own Philippine rail. And with that, I now move you to Christian, who will talk about the next ex uh, set of, of history on the French publishers of the 18th century. Sorry about that, I will start again. Thank you, Jesse, and good morning, everyone. There were uh, several publishers in the 18th century who, who mentioned Philippine birds. I will focus on three of them. The first one being Pierre Sonrat, uh, who was a French naturalist and explorer who actually visited the Philippines, unlike many of the other publishers, in the years 1771-72, at a very young age. He was 23. And he wrote a book in 1776 entitled Voyage to New Guinea, which is a bit of a misnomer because uh, 126 out of the 200 pages are on the Philippines and the rest is uh, on uh, New Guinea and his trip from Europe and back to Europe. So it should have been called Voyage to the Philippines really. In that book, he describes and illustrates 57 species of Philippine uh, birds that uh, we will see some of illustrations. Uh, this uh, pictures on the right is uh, interesting. It shows a young Sonra here uh, sitting, taking notes while a, a local woman is presenting um, captive birds and is taking notes on the bird. This particular illustration was clearly made in New Guinea, not in the Philippines, but it gives an idea of the sort of explorer that he was. He was not hiking mountains and walking through forests. He was, as, he was getting locals to get birds for him and showing the birds. Uh, here is um, an example of a bird illustrated by uh, Sonrad, the white braided wood swallow. Um, wait, I have to... he, uh, he landed in uh, Cavite and he visited Laguna, uh, Manila, of course, Laguna, Panay, and Zamboanga. And he provides in his book a lot of detailed impressions of everything he saw in the country. In particular, he describes trees, fruits, flowers, insects, and birds. Actually, his main interest seemed to have been birds. He, give, he gives common French name to the birds, but he was not attempting to formalize uh, the names of birds. These were more like captions for the pictures than formal names for the birds. And again, he was not watching birds only. He was catching birds and actually killing birds and bringing back the skins with him to, to Europe. So he does not really describe uh, actual observation of uh, birds in habitat. He describes uh, skins of dead birds. Still, that book was a major reference for Philippine birds for about 100 years. 
Uh, here are two examples of <coughs> common birds that uh, Sona illustrated, the yellow vented bulbul, a very common garden bird in Manila, and the collard kingfisher, not a very common bird until now. Spotted button quail and king quail are birds that are now extremely difficult to see uh, in, in, uh, in Luzon or in the Philippines, but they were common, commonly seen and captured around Manila at the time. The uh, spotted button quail is a Philippine endemic bird. On the left, the Luzon bleeding heart, common and easy to see and catch at the time, extremely difficult to see nowadays, deep in the forest. And on the right, a white wagtail, which is a, a, a migratory bird, rather uncommon, but uh, somehow was lucky to see one, or perhaps it was common at the time, I'm not very sure. Um, so those uh, are the, the kind of um, illustrations that Sonar provided. Um, another author is uh, Maturin Brisson, who's a French scientist, and he, pub he published a six volume book called Ornithology in 1760. That was before Sonar's trip, so he was not, not actually using Son Sonar's material. He described all the birds known in the world at the time, uh, 1,336 species, of which 21 were Philippine birds. So you see here the title page of the book and a, a portrait of Mother Brisson. I'll give you two examples of uh, birds illustrated by Brisson. The first one is a spot bill pelican, a bird that was uh, reported to be uh, very common at the time. Uh, it was seen in large numbers in Laguna Lake. It was seen and captured and eaten, of course. Uh, it is now extirpated from the Philippines. It has not been seen in the Philippines since the early to mid uh, 20th century. It exists, the species exists in other countries, so it's not extinct, it's just extirpated from the Philippines. Um, Brisson never traveled, he did not come to the Philippines. He was describing specimens or skins found in various collections in Paris. So that's why there is no information on habitat and calls, local names. Uh, the European travelers coming to the Philippines, they would come on, uh, could be trade missions, diplomatic missions, maybe geographical surveys, but uh, people on board would go on land and uh, uh, catch, kill birds, hunt, kill birds, and bring back the skins. And the skins would be uh, kept in their own collections or sold to collectors or given to museums. And those are the skins that uh, uh, Brisson was, was uh, using. Um, here another example, the Philippine cockatoo and the blue net parrots. Philippine cockatoo was extremely common at the time. It could, it could be seen all over the Philippines, all the islands of the Philippines. It was a common garden birds in the gardens in Manila. It is now extremely rare uh, with a, a small population in, uh, in Palawan and a few sightings here and there in the rest of the Philippines, but very few. It's uh, critically endangered on the verge of extinction. Uh, the, the skins that were uh, taken by the, the travelers to the Philippines were, you have to remember, they were kept in storage in the ships first and then in storage in Europe for a uh, long time, months, years. So sometimes the feathers were uh, damaged, discolored. Uh, so the artists who represented, uh, represented these perched birds had to use their imagination because they were working from uh, dead skins, skins of dead birds. So sometimes like this, the, the, the habit or the position of this cockatoo doesn't seem like the real one. Uh, the third one is Comte de Buffon, or we call him Buffon, a French naturalist who published a 10 volume uh, natural history of birds in 1770-86. So that means mostly after uh, Sonera's uh, voyage. So he was actually using some of Sonera's uh, materials. In that book, he um, illustrated more than 1,000 uh, birds, including 31 Philippine birds. So these uh, illustrations were made with copper plate engraving and hand colored. There was no process to print in color at the time. So they had to print uh, with this color plate uh, uh, process in black and white and then hand color each and every copy. I'll give you a few uh, examples of the birds illustrated by Buffon. Uh, this one is the Philippine Kukal. Um, as I said, like, like the previous ones, he did not formalize the names and did not choose the scientific names yet. 
So this, he said, okay, this looks like a cuckoo. It's from the Philippines. So you will call it cuckoo the Philippines or Philippine cuckoo. Um, still, it's, uh, it's um, a very, very interesting reference to, uh, to find out what species is represented. Um, copper speed barbet. So remember, as I said, every uh, copy was hand colored. So if a book was published in say a thousand copies, each and every one of the thousand copies had to be colored by hand by painters, a rather labor intensive process. But that's a, it's a beautiful illustration of the copper speed barbet. Colasisi, male and female, sometimes called Philippine hanging parrot. Beautiful illustration of a blue net parrot, nice, nice colors, yeah. And finally, a Philippine cockatoo, another one, which I think is much better than uh, Brisson's, who published that 20, 30 years earlier. Okay, we are now uh, towards the end of the 18th century. From 1790 to 1820, there was a, a, a sort of a pause in explorations uh, and publications uh, about birds around the world. The reason was the political turmoil, the French Revolution, the French Revolutionary Wars, Napoleonic Wars, all the ships that would roam around the world, including around the Philippines, were Navy ships, British Navy and others. No more explorers and, 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 and uh, ornithologists. But starting in the 1920s, um, in the 19th century, there would be an explosion of um, uh, uh, bird discoveries in the Philippines. And I will give the floor back to Jesse to talk about that. So I'll be moving into the next part, which uh, is on the noteworthy birds from the Spanish colonial period. Again, because as mentioned by Christian, there were very few collections at the time. So we'll move a bit to a different part of the story um, around the time of the colonial period to another set of Josephs, Jose Lozano and Jose Rizal. So Jose Honorato Lozano um, is a well-known Filipino painter who actually did, uh, famous for the Letras y Figuras, which is an art form which uses uh, um, forms of people and places into words. But it's also known for the detailed watercolor paintings uh, about the way of life in the Philippines during the 19th century. So I think, but one of the things in front of it is he uses a lot of birds in some of his paintings. So I think this is sort of like the first two uh, Filipino artists to feature birds in their art in 1847. Uh, surprisingly, he used the largest and most conspicuous birds uh, immortalized in his artwork, including the stork, the pelican, and a crane, as mentioned uh, on the pelican by Christian earlier. Uh, some of the paintings also had birds which are a little difficult to identify, like the one on the right, we have a, on the bottom right, you have, I think it's either a swallow or a wagtail. On the upper part is either a pigeon or a crow. So we don't have an all black pigeon, so it probably is a crow that looks like a pigeon. But anyway, it is, it is an art form. Um, one of the things that interested me was Jose Norato Lozano actually depicted some of those uh, birds in alongside traditional Filipino apparel um, during the 1850s. Um, and so actually some of these were actually put into a postcard by Ayala Museum. I don't know if you have some of them um, able to collect them when you visited the Ayala Museum. So all those three important species are in A, you have the Saras crane, uh, Grusen Kikuni Luzonus, which is described as a nemic subspecies. Uh, of course, the cross mentioned that this is now extinct uh, from the Philippines. Uh, so most of these species actually uh, were lost during the 20th century. Um, the spot-billed pelican uh, on B, um, as mentioned by Chris earlier, uh, Pelicanus is named after, after the Philippines, but it still occurs outside the Philippines, so it's not yet extinct, it is extirpated. And then lastly, you have the woolly neck stork, Sucone episcopus, widely used to be widely spread around the Philippines, but now um, uh, no record, recent records have indicated it still occurs. And if, again, it's extirpated from the Philippines. Another artwork by Lozano uh, features a lot of birds. Uh, it's only one plate, the plate 68. It's featured in his book in 1847 called Album de las Filipinas y Traces de sus Habitantes. Um, one of that page is called Pajaros for birds. Uh, of course, of the Philippines, it's that indicating that they are abundant and a lot of color. And of course, with that color, um, it actually represents the first colored bird guide. 
for the Philippines. There's about 19 birds labeled, handwritten in Spanish, and then only another page actually represents uh, another 13 species, or well, 13 birds, highlighted with brief description, also quite um, handwritten in Spanish. So I'm going to give you an expert about those, uh, a few species notable. Uh, the one on number one is Paloma, you see the numbers, uh, Paloma de Ternate, which actually is a crown pigeon uh, from Indonesia, um, mostly from New Guinea Island. And then you have Maya de Costa, which is a Java sparrow, originally from Java, although some of them are introduced elsewhere, including the Philippines. Pogo, referring to spotted pudding quail. Coleta, of course, is an American species of the Philippines. Another one interesting was the Paloma de Punyalada. Uh, Punyalada means to uh, bleed in the heart, so it's the bleeding heart. Of course, looking at the Luzon bleeding heart. There are other birds known as Loro de Holo, um, probably taken from Holo, but actually represents a lot of species which look like birds from Indonesia, such as a chattering lorry or an eclectus parrot. One species called the Pipit de Siete Colores, actually is an, a name we often refer to the purple sun, sunbird. Kakatawa is the Philippine cockatoo. Maya Paking is a scaly breasted munia. Loro de Pampanga looks actually like a blue nape parrot. And lastly, you have the Kulasisi, very much uh, known as the Lyricus of the Pens of the Kulasisi. So probably the, the number of Indonesian uh, species either are brought into the Philippines as cage birds, or because at the time the Philippines were kind of not fully recognized in terms of boundaries. So a lot kind of like confusion, which part actually is still Indonesia and which is the part which is Philippines. Another Jose, which I think is important is our national hero, Jose Rizal. And part of the historical accounts actually highlight in his young age, at the age of I think four or five, that he observed birds uh, out uh, at the patio or the window of his home in Calamba. And actually noted listing several species, although there were only about notes of about five or six species, the Maria Capra, the Culiawan, the Pipit, the Martini, the Maya, and the Kulau. So I went through the translations in Wolf, and these represents four species, uh, the Maria Capra, or the Philippine Pied Fantail, the Culiawan, or the Black Oriole, the Pipit, which is the olive back sunbird, and the Maya Mija, which refers to either the Maya Paquin, which is the scaly bird of Bunya, or the chestnut in itself. So in a way, you think of it, Jose Rizal was the first Filipino bird watcher. So looking at those listings uh, of, of Jose Rizal, the Martini or the Martinez is actually an introduced species. That actually accounts one of the earlier um, expansions of an introduced bird. So the Crescent Mina, as noted by Rizal in Calamba in 1864, was actually introduced into Manila and uh, around Manila earlier in about 1850, 1849. So it was introduced from China as a means to control the migratory locusts. Uh, by then, Spanish government of the Philippines, Juan Martinez. Um, and of course, now you can note that it has expanded into Calamba or Laguna. The Maya, of course, we refer to the Munya. We also now refer to the Maya, which is Pasar Martana. So there's sort of a confusion nowadays, but before it wasn't that, it was clear that the Maya refers to the Munya and the tree sparrow, which we call Maya, is actually called Gorion. And it actually in Cebu, they still use the name Gorion for tree sparrow. And Gorion is actually Spanish for tree sparrow. So it was introduced in early 1900s. Uh, there was an, a blog that represented, they think the reason for introducing the tree sparrow was because the colonialists were familiar with it and it helps combat homesickness. But we now have this confusion uh, that the tree sparrow is a national bird. No, we actually refer still to the original Maya, which is the chest of Puna, which was also called the Philippine weaver. Lastly, we have the name Kulau. So this kind of results mystery bird because uh, one article which looks into that history where they were try trying to um, identify the species of bird. And one excerpt actually said it probably was a kalau because it had the same similar spelling or the Rufus Hornbillet, which actually historically um, the Plaza de Calamba is quite, um, there's a lot of habitation, not much that trees. So it wouldn't be the Rufus Hornbill because Rufus Hornbills refer read a dense wall. Although it is found in Mount Makiding, it is unlikely that it is the Kalau. It's probably a misspelling of the Kuhau, 
which is the how the Asian uh, coel, which of course will be known to occur around the houses during the 19th century in Galamba. And with that, again, I bring you back to Christian, who then, then go through the interesting collections that occurred on the second half of the 19th century. Ah, okay, thank you, Jesse. Uh, as I said, there, uh, under mute, uh, there, are there were many explorers in the Philippines in the second half of the 19th century. I will focus on three uh, or three teams. A team is usually one explorer and one publisher. So Alfred uh, Everett is the first explorer and Walden is the, the publisher. Uh, Alfred Everett was a British civil servant administrator in Borneo, and uh, he was a naturalist, natural history collector. And while he was based in Borneo, he traveled extensively to the Philippines from uh, uh, 1869 to around 1877, and uh, uh, collected many, uh, many skins of birds. Many birds are named after him, including four Philippine birds, including, I uh, have a list here, the Everest Scops Owl and Everest's White Eye, Bird watchers among you would be familiar with this species. And one of them here is illustrated in, um, in a, uh, a magazine uh, in uh, London by Walden, and that's the yellowish bulbul Ipsipetes Everetti, named after Everett. Walden didn't come to the Philippines. Uh, but was a publisher of Everett's uh, discoveries. Uh, his name is a bit difficult. His name was Arthur Hay, but he's known until 1876 as Viscount Walden, and after that date as Arthur the Ninth Marquis of Tweedale. So birds uh, that he uh, named are uh, credited to Walden before that date and credited to Tweedale after that date, but it's the same person. He was a Scottish uh, soldier uh, and ornithologist. He became president of the Zoological Society of London. He had a large collection of uh, 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 birds, uh, bird skins, meaning, and other animals. Um, bird, watcher was, bird watchers will be familiar with the Walden's hornbill, a rare uh, species that is found in uh, Panay and, uh, and uh, Negros, that was named after him. Um, and he published in 1875 a paper called A List of Birds Known to Inhabit the Philippine Archipelago. Um, in that uh, paper, he describes 218 species of Philippine birds. He did not travel to the Philippines, as I said, but he provides extensive references to all the previous publications. So it's a very useful paper if you want to research on the history of ornithology. It's a major uh, uh, reference for history. Uh, interestingly, he did not consider Palawan and Sulu as part of the Philippines in, in, from a zoological point of view. He considered that the birds of Palawan and Sulu were actually uh, Borneo birds and did not include them in his list. Uh, we have here a, uh, so we have a nice illustration of uh, uh, Philippine uh, hawk eagle here from that paper. Another illustration uh, of three different owls from the Philippines, including one, the one in the, at the bottom right, uh, the Philippine Scops owl that was first named by uh, Walden in that paper in 1875. Another beautiful illustration of the right on bill. Uh, you can really see the difference in the quality of the illustrations in the 19th century compared to what we saw at the end of the 18th century where they were using copper plates and um, and color. Here they're using a lithographic process, that means a stone plate that allows a much higher quality of engraving and also uh, color printing. So major improvement over the, the, the 18th century. Another beautiful illustration of Visayan hornbill. Yellow-faced flimback in a different paper. It's a, a bird from Panay and Negros. And there is a series of uh, uh, papers uh, illustrating the birds collected by Everett, in this case in the island of Cebu, the Philippine Oriole. It's interesting because the Philippine Oriole is now considered extinct from the island of Cebu, still found in Mindanao and other, other provinces, or other islands, I mean, but uh, not in Cebu. 
So another um, locally extinct bird. Philippine leaf bird. This is again a collection made by Everett in the island of Cebu. Philippine leaf bird also considered extinct from Cebu, although it's still found in Mindanao and other places. And at the bottom, the Cebu flower pecker. That is not considered extinct, but ex uh, considered critically endangered, extremely rare. And actually, there has not been any sighting for many years now. And um, many, many ornithologists are wondering if it's not already extinct. And if it's extinct from Cebu, it's extinct from the planet because it's only found, found in Cebu. It's a Cebu flower pecker. So, a bit of a sad story there. Uh, other birds. Uh, in this case, uh, collected by Everett in Bindanao. The bird watchers among you will be familiar with these birds. I will just show you um, a few, just to show you the, the, the beautiful illustrations published by Walden. Uh, birds from the island of Dinagat, again, collected by Everett. This one from Negros, beautiful uh, flame-tempered babbler also by, uh, from Everett, from the island of Palawan, and from Zamboanga, the giant scops owl, and the Philippine spine-tailed swift, also called needle swift. Okay, the second team I want to uh, cover is uh, Joseph Steer and, uh, and, and Sharp. Um, Joseph Steer was an American ornithologist. Uh, he uh, participated in a scientific expedition to the Philippines in 1874-75 and turned over all the, uh, the skins to the British Museum uh, and to Richard Sharp. We'll see that in the next slide. He organized himself a scientific expedition to the Philippines in 1887 and 88. After that, he published a uh, paper called A List of Birds and Mammals Collected by the Steer Expeditions in the Philippines. Uh, and he named 15 new Philippine endemic species in that paper. I have a list here of birds named after him, including the, the famous Steer Spita. I say famous because the Steer Spita is high on the list of, on the wish list of, uh, of bird watchers coming to the Philippines from the broad. Uh, here is a, a, a Steers team of uh, students of the University of Michigan in 1887. They spent about 12 months in the Philippines, explored every corner of the Philippines. And Steer was the first one who divided the Philippines into what we call biogeographical regions. Uh, that means group of islands where the species are the same or similar, because they were, those islands were still connected by land until relatively recent uh, geographical times. So he has the Luzon, Mindoro, the Eastern Visayas, Western Visayas, um, South Philippines, Mindanao, and, uh, and Palawan group. And this grouping is still used nowadays, but he's the first uh, one who proposed that grouping of biological, biogeographical regions for the Philippines. Richard Sharp was uh, the publisher. He was uh, in charge of the birds, the bird collection in the British Museum, and he published a paper called On the Birds Collected by Professor Steer in the Philippines Archipelago, the Philippine Archipelago, 1877. And I'm going to show you a few of the illustrations in, uh, in that paper. Beautiful illustrations, again, really high quality color lithographic process. I'm not going to discuss the birds themselves. They are birds that are still around and that, that the uh, bird watchers would be familiar with uh, nowadays. The steer spita, the famous steer spita. Very difficult to see deep in the forest. All the birds from uh, Mindanao. And uh, birds from Sulu, but this one's collected by Everett. Uh, so he was uh, uh, publishing uh, from other collectors too. Okay, and the third team is uh, John Whitehead and uh, William O.G. V. Grant. John Whitehead was an English explorer, a professional collector of bird specimen. I'm not sure what professional collector is, but that, that's, he was selling bird specimens. 
Uh, between 1893 and 96, that's for three years, he explored the Philippines and collected many new species, including the Philippine eagle. We'll see that in the next slide. He intended to return to the Philippines in 1899, when the Philippines was already occupied by the Americans, but because of the outbreak of the Philippine-American War, he could not come, he could not land, he went to Hainan, and there he became sick and he died of a fever at a young age. Uh, a bird was named after him, the white-head swiftlet, um, Philippine uh, endemic species. Now, William Ogilvy Grant was a British ornithologist. He did not travel to the Philippines. He was the publisher. Again, the team is one collector, one publisher. But he's best known, at least in the Philippines, for having provided the scientific, scientific name for the Philippine eagle, the national uh, bird of the Philippines in uh, 1896 from a skin collected by John Whitehead in Samar. Interestingly, the Philippine eagle is best known from Mindanao now, maybe lesser known from Luzon and not well known from Samar, but that first skin was actually from Samar. The scientific name, Piteco Faga, Piteco means uh, monkey in Greek, Faga to eat, so monkey eater, and Jeffrey, Je Jeffrey was actually the father of John Whitehead. So. Uh, uh, it's an example of a bird that is named after someone who was not even an ornithologist and did not do much to discover the species, but we will see other examples of that later. That illustration was published in a, a magazine called The Ibis in uh, 1897, one year after the first description of the bird. And if you go to the Natural History Museum in Luneta, in a, in a atrium, there is on the wall, there is a huge uh, uh, illustration from floor to, to ceiling of that particular, that particular engraving by OGP Grant. It's worth a visit if you have not been there. More birds named and described and illustrated by uh, OGP Grant. This one's from uh, the, the Cordilleras, Northern Luzon. More birds from the Cordilleras. Again, birds that the bird watchers would be very familiar with. Uh, more birds here on the right. Uh, just to conclude the 19th century, you have noticed that all the ornithologists of these past two centuries were either European or American. There is no substantial publication by a Spanish author. Yeah, there is casual reference to birds uh, as part of a larger work, but no, uh, nothing specializing in ornithology. The, 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 the colonial government and the, the, during the Spanish time uh, had no, no interest in ornithology. They, they were interested in birds mostly to, to hunt them and eat them. There are many references to, uh, to hunting and eating birds in the in the Spanish literature in the Philippines. And because of that, there was no uh, Philippine ornithologist, Filipino ornithologist who emerged during the period. Uh, and we will see that uh, will change with the arrival of the Americans. And I will uh, turn the floor back to Jesse to uh, talk about the, the transition from the 19th to the 20th century. Back to you. So I'll now talk about the well, part, still part of the, uh, the mid 19th century. Um, it's about the illustrados and the emergence of the catalog of Casa de Elera. So as mentioned, there's not much studies by the Spanish uh, during that time, except for the illustrados and of course, for Casa de Elera, a Casa de Elera. Of course, the illustrados were the ones which are educated and well-traveled. So they were exposed to zoos um, and natural sciences as part of their courses when they were premed, such as what happened with Jose Rizal, and Antonio Luna, which were students of Caso de Herrera. Um, Rizal, for that matter, actually took natural history when he was in Ateneo. Uh, he took his, um, uh, his bachelor degree in um, Municipal Ateneo de Manila in Intramuros. And as you see here, here's a picture of, by John Till in 1887 uh, of the natural history room of that particular um, school in Manila. But unfortunately, that was lost to fire in 1932. In a way, Rizal carried on that interest in natural history when he was exiled in Dapita in Zamboanga from 1892 to 1896. As you know, I think uh, Dr. Afan will talk about that um, when he collected some famous herbs that was named after him. For reason that he was collecting specimens and sending them to uh, foreign museums, particularly in Germany, 
to Adolf Mayer, which is the director of Dresden Museum, which of course he exchanges for books. Um, but because he was in exile, he was not allowed to have a gun. So he was pinned for having a gun and unable to shoot birds and collect birds. So only collected about 13 birds at the time. Um, among those important natural history collections that build up in the Philippines um, was, of course, the first natural history collection represented by the Museo de Historia Natural of the University of Santo Tomas. Um, it, of course, referred to the oldest and most extensive collection at the time. Um, it was, the museum was created about 1870-71, and the efforts of then professor of natural history, Reverend Father Casa de Lera, was the one who wanted to, who push, pushed into the classification and cataloging of the specimens that they had. So it was about an estimate about 10,000 specimens of natural uh, science collections around it. Um, it's noted it was still exhibited at about sometime in 1911, which is an old postcard, uh, but much of it is now uh, was then taken away um, and not seen by the public for some time, except for the ones that it was exhibited in the new um, Museum now, uh, of Arts and Sciences in UST. Of course, De Lera was a foremost a Dominican scientist. We actually encourage um, gaining acquisition of specimens uh, around the provinces and offer exchange from, from farms and thus building up a substantial collection of birds within the country. And this is noted in his catalog, which is the first scientific catalog in the Philippines published in 1895, the uh, systematic catalog of all Philippine fauna known today, that of the zoological collection at the museum of Santo Tomas in Manila. However, even though this is early attempts to compile the comprehensive list of faunal diversity in the Philippines, not all of the catalog included are in, from, from the Philippines. There are some specimens, of course, collected from outside the Philippines, such as the one pictured in A, which is a knob hornbill. Uh, actually, in the catalog, it says it's from Gilolo, Sulawesi. What's interesting about the specimens that they collected were rare specimens that are no longer found in the wild such as the Saras Crane, I think we have six from the Basia and Pangasinan, the Spot-Hilled Pelican, the Laguna and Cavite, actually from Calamba, the Oriental Tartar from Calamba in Manila, Walden's Hornbill from Gimaras, no longer found in Gimaras, and the specimen of the Sulu Bleeding Heart, which I think I need to see from Tawi Tawi, supposedly in the catalog of uh, De Lera. And with that, I bring you back to Christian to go into the early American administration and of course the birth of the science, Bureau of Science in Manila. Thank you. I, I'm going to talk about the early American administration and the Bureau of Science. And I will talk, I will start with uh, Dean Wooster. Um, there was a lot of excitement uh, among American, um, Americans in general and uh, American zoologists and American ornithologists about what they call our new territories. And a lot of official interest in natural sciences in general in the, in the American administration. Dean Wooster became the Secretary of the Interior uh, of the Philippine, uh, uh, so the Philippine Commission at the beginning from 1901 to uh, 1913. And he established the Bureau of Science in 1901 and in the Bureau of Science, a division of ornithology. Uh, we can see um, uh, Dean Wooster here uh, on the left in the picture. Uh, with an ornithologist in that position, uh, Secretary of the Interior, you can imagine that there was a lot of official uh, backing for exploration trips in the remote areas of the country. It was a bit of a different from, difference from the previous uh, Spanish administration. Uh, why was Dean uh, Wooster chosen? He actually had uh, been to the Philippines uh, twice and knew the Philippines very well. With his friends, uh, his friend Frank Bones, there are, um, there's a picture of the two of them here, a uh, picture taken in Guimaras, actually. He participated in a steer expedition to the Philippines in 1887-88. We, we have talked about the spear expedition earlier. And in 1891 and 93, uh, they joined another scientific expedition to the Philippines. So they uh, participated in two long expeditions and very familiar with the Philippines. In 1898, they uh, published jointly a list of the birds known to inhabit the Philippine and Palawan Islands, and we listed 526 species. Uh, so it's one of the one of the factors why he was qualified to become the minister, the, the secretary of the interior. 
Um, another American ornithologist uh, that I will mention, there were many in that period, or several at least, that I will mention, just a few. Um, he was an American ornithologist and he uh, wrote a description of a new genus and several and uh, 11 new species of Philippine birds in 1905. And one of the birds he named was the Aposan bird, Aito Piga Boltoni, white Boltoni. He says this beautiful sunbird was seen on Mount Apo uh, up to the actual summit. And it is named in honor of first Lieutenant Edward Bolton, military governor of Davao district. So you see that he must have obtained a lot of logistical uh, assistance from the, uh, from the military, from that particular officer and named the bird after him, even though that officer didn't do anything in terms of ornithology uh, per se. Another example is the Bagobo babbler. Uh, the, the scientific name is Leonard Dina Woody. It was named in honor of Major General Leonard Wood, US Army, who as governor of the Moro province has encouraged every form of scientific effort in uh, Mindanao. So another example of a bird named after an American officer who helped the, the discoverers. Uh, the illustration here is actually from Achi, Achisuka, which is a bit later in 1931, but the bird at the bottom here is the Bagobo babbler. Another bird he described and named is McGregor's cuckoo shrike in the Philippine Journal of Science, named after Richard McGregor. So who is Richard McGregor? Uh, we will talk about him now. That's Richard McGregor. He was an American ornithologist. And he was actually a friend of Dean Wooster, who called him to come to the Philippines. And he was connected with the Bureau of Science from his arrival in 1902 until, uh, particularly until his death in 1936. He died in Manila and he was with the Bureau of Science all that time. He was the editor of the Philippine Journal of Science. Uh, he was, uh, it seems that he was only interested in birds. His life was birds, bird watching and ornithology. Uh, he, of course, traveled extensively around the Philippines, and he had always with him his Filipino assistant, Andres Celestino, who had already worked for John Whitehead in the past, and uh, who I think we can call the first Filipino ornithologist. Although he did not publish anything under his name, he had an extensive knowledge of all the birds of the Philippines, their range, their calls, their habits. Uh, the seasons in, in case of uh, migratory birds. So I would say it's the first Filipino ornithologist. A uh, subspecies of the small button quail was named after him, Turnix Silvaticus Celestinoi. His son, Manuel Celestino, was also a, a bird collector and also had a subspecies of Coppersmith Barbet named after him. Um, McGregor published a very important book, the uh, Manual of Philippine Birds in Manila in 1909, a big book, 769 pages. And for the first time, he was actually using English common names uh, instead of uh, uh, only scientific names. In the 19th century, in all the, at least all the English language publications on birds, they were only using scientific names. So you have to, if you want to know what they're talking about, you have to really go back and find what scientific name was used at the time, which might be different from the one used now. So he was, he was using, using English common name and indicates also a lot of the local names uh, when they're available. Unfortunately, that book is full of information, very interesting, but it has no illustration. So I cannot show you an illustration. I show you the only the title page of the book. Um, a bit later in 1928, Richard McGregor contributed to a book called Distribution of Life in the Philippines by Dick, uh, Roy Dickerson. And in that book, there were uh, small illustrations uh, in a text. And these are examples of illustrations made by, uh, by McGregor. Um, he, uh, McGregor, uh, described and named the Wooster's button quail uh, in 1904 in honor of Dean Wooster. And he describes uh, he describes it as adult female, Philippine Museum collection purchased in Quinta Market, Manila, August 1902, probably from Paranaque, Luzon. So Quinta Market was a famous market, including a, a market for, for birds. In, uh, this is a postcard around 1902 that shows Quinta Market along the, the, the Pasig River. Now this picture, the, the, 
Worcester's bottom quail is a Philippine endemic. It's a very rare bird. Uh, it is seen, uh, it's difficult to see uh, seen very early, but it's an endemic. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it does not migrate, but it uh, moves around Luzon. Uh, it's very hard to track. This picture is a famous picture because it was taken in uh, 2009 by Arnel Telesforo. It's a, a bird that was captured by the local in, uh, in um, uh, Dalton Pass, you know, between River Isira and River Vizcaya, going to Pagan Valley. They put a net uh, sometimes of the year to catch the migratory bird that fly over the ridge there. And that bird was caught in the net. It was about to be sold in the market and eaten, but somebody took a picture. Somebody, Arnel, took a picture. And it was later identified as an extremely rare uh, uh, Worcester's button quail. I think that's the last picture that I know of, uh, of that bird. And finally, uh, McGregor are illustrated and uh, described and named the, the five crown flower pecker in the Philippine Journal of Science. Uh, it was uh, collected in Polis Mountain, if Ifugao sub province by McGregor and Celestino. And uh, the bird watchers among you will be able to relate to the, the last paragraph here, collected in a mossy forest near the summit of the government trail between Banaue and Bontoc. It is a very well-known um, bird watching site until now. And that is where I have uh, seen this bird. It's probably the only place where you can uh, see it uh, reliably. And then with that, I have finished with the early uh, American uh, uh, administration. I will pass the floor back to Jesse. Back to you, Jesse. On your, you know, would I? It's actually an illustration taken from Hachisuka. And Hachisuka was one of the um, prominent explorers um, after the, well, still part of the American period, but he came to the Philippines um, before the war but of course will go after the war on the birth of the Philippine National Museum. So it was the first Japanese expedition to the Philippines. It was headed by uh, Masawi Hachisuka, which is actually a nobility. He's the 18th Marquis de Hachisuka. He's actually a nephew of Prince Tokugawa, the last shogun. Um, most of the ornithologists in, in Japan are actually part of the nobility, including Dr. Kuroda, Dr. Uh, Dan Yamashina, and even now um, Prince Akishino is the head of the Yamashina Institute, which is, of course, the brother of the emperor. Um, so pre-war, in 1929, um, Hachisuka and Yukio Nakamura went to the Philippines to study the distribution of the avifauna birds of the Philippines, particularly in the Zon Basila and Mindanao. Of course, being Cambridge educated, he was well-versed into uh, uh, the science of ornithology. He published immediately two volume set on the contributions of birds to the Philippines in 1929. It was more like a checklist uh, covering uh, the, the results of their expedition. However, later on, he made a well illustrated and in depth four volume set on the birds of the Philippine Islands with notes on the mammalian fauna. And actually, if you want to read through that, it's actually available online through isu.com, all four volumes. So you can use that link on the bottom to get to the dose. You can't print, you can't download them, it's just read only. So, but still beautiful, it's all colored um, and available online. So it goes through a detailed description of the 577 species hmm, and subspecies of uh, birds from the Philippines, but actually he started lumping many of the species together. So it's actually start of the age of the lumpers, we call it, where in a lot of species were put together as polytypic species. Uh, lessening the number that was actually described by Mike Recker um, from the 395 species. Um, if you want to go through the interesting notes, anecdotes that was noted by Christian, you go to that particular short um, um, Ebon article on the history of, of Philippine bird books. So again, this is a photo of Hachisuka and the cover of the, the one of the volumes. It was interesting because the, most of the illustrations were well done uh, at the time. Um, again, it's just an, a large advancement in terms of printing. Um, beautiful illustrations of the plant peacock, Philippic eagle. Now with, of course, clutching a proper e monkey, then called monkey eating eagle. Uh, beautiful colorations of the uh, endemic pigeons from the fruit doves, uh, um, Marchese fruit dove, cream bellied 
and yellow-breasted. Also the passerines, a lot of the species um, already described but were redrawn uh, by uh, the illustrators of Achisuka. So actually it's good to have the ability because you have access to a lot of good illustrators. A wonderful illustration of the, uh, I think this is a large build, a uh, parrot rather than a blue nape. Then you have the guiaberos. You have the um, babblers on the top, including a beautiful flame tail from Papler. Um, and the different notavas or the blue fly catchers. So a lot of species that were collected by just actually tried to describe. Um, unusually, it didn't turn out well for most of the species. Um, other than, there's a lot of turnover in terms of the descriptions he made. So one is he added a genus for the um, then known um, uh, autos, uh, no, it was a different genus for a particular Scops owl, what's it called? Scops is the lesser eagle owl, which is then called Mimizuku Gournay. Of course, later on, it's recognized as a large Scops owl. Um, one did actually is still valid, the green-faced parrot finch. Um, the Luzon Cyrus crane in a recent paper in 2020 recognizes it as a valid subspecies. And then lastly, we have the gray-hooded sunbird, which is still a valid species. However, the genus, uh, of course, was synonymized. So a lot of the subspecies that we described were mostly synonymized or put into synonymy. Um, he did a lot of books, including further uh, contributions to more ornithology Philippines. He noted a collection from Hirazawa, from Davao, which represents 128 species, including four specimens of the Philippine eagle and two specimens of the Mimizugo Borne. So at the time, it was already towards the start of the war. Uh, 1939, 1941, 1940 to 1945, uh, a lot of naturalists in Japan were hampered, um, but a lot of them were quite interested in the natural history of what then they called the conquered lands. Um, of course, a lot of them were also having their collections to put in safety. So the Hachisuka collection was put in combined with the Yamashina collection in Tokyo University collection, and thus they were saved. Um, actually, later on, Dylan Ripley, uh, some part of that collection was put into the Yale Pida Museum in the US, and then split into Delaware and Smithsonian. However, not all of them uh, are, are put into safety. Some of them, of course, were kept here in the Bureau of Science in Manila and were lost, uh, including one which is the type for the uh, Visayan um, elegant tit. And with that, there's a lot of um, um, clamor in terms of re. Um, recollecting a lot of those lost types and lost representatives of the species when the Bureau of Science was destroyed in the Battle of Manila. So a, a 40 years of collections were lost. Uh, however, the, uh, then the National Museum uh, reestablished itself. And of course, they started recollecting. Fortunately, for some of the holotypes, there were some sin types and fire types saved in the other museums outside the Philippines. However, some of them were just truly lost. Um, so they had to recollect and assign Neotype. So from then, from 1945 to 1960, there's a lot of expeditions carried out by the then National Museum, and most of which are Filipino collectors, uh, headed, of course, by Ben Canuto Manuel, um, including Castro, Nuevo, Celestino, Anton Juane, and Ramos, and of course, then uh, Dr. Uh, yeah, Dr. Robor. Um, actually, for several neotypes were described by Manuel, including 27 in one list at the Philippine Journal of Science. Some of which, of course, still are valid, such as the Polydio Trichic Hornbill and the Polydio Blue Bank. Um, Dr. Kunutumel, of course, is a recognized Philippine ornithologist, as mentioned by Christian. It was hard to tell who was an ornithologist then, so I think this one represents that Kanuto, because he published, uh, is a Filipino ornithologist. Uh, of course, he was also the chief zoologist at the Bureau of Science at the time. Um, he did a review of the Philippine pigeons. Um, uh, uh, birds of the islands of Polilio, Palawan, and Boswanga. So several other papers, and of course, describe several species, including this one, which is uh, then Nucleopteron faustina, which is now a subspecies of the cream-bellied fruit dove. Um, some of it are still valid. The uh, Asipiter trovicatus castro is still valid. Uh, Otus uh, batanensis is now uh, under Rukiu. Um, Rupi trupala is now synonymized under Ms. Uh, Antonia, I think. Um, of course, there are several birds named after Manuel. 
uh, most famous of which is the uh, white breasted munya uh, manueli and the um, purple throated sunbird. Interesting about it is all the results of the, the work done by McGregor, uh, by Manuel, and of course by Hachisuka were carried over in a book in 1946 called The Birds of the Philippines. I actually have a copy with me. Um, and it's quite, it's, it's uh, authored by two famous people, John Delacour and Ernest Mayer. John Delacour is just a French born American ornithologist, was then a director of the LA County Museum. And of course, Ernest Mayer is a renowned evolutionary biologist, taxonomist, and ornithologist. And of course, the director of the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. Um, however, there are no records of them coming to the Philippines. Actually, Ernest Mayer went into the Pacific Islands. Um, uh, Delacour went into Indochina. Uh, but they all build up on what's already there uh, from McGregor and Hachisuka. So they listed about 450 species uh, from the Philippines plus 20 from Palawan altogether. But what's interesting about this book is uh, the illustrations are made up of these black and white kind of engraving style um, illustrations. They're quite beautiful. Um, the, it also marks the extension of what we call the age of the lumpers because they also lumped a lot of species. That's why it's only 470 species. Even the bleeding hearts, we recognize these five species are all just one species with several subspecies. So it's a polytypic species. After then, we have the start of the collabor uh, collaborative expeditions of a lot of Filipinos with a lot of international uh, museums. And of course, that includes Dr. Rabor, uh, which then kind of pushed a lot of new species and subspecies being discovered. So it was all headed by um, Alcasi, Rabor, and Gonzalez uh, during a lot of international expeditions with different museums. Um, again, still the age of the lumpers with a proliferation of subspecies and clustering them into single species. Uh, Dr. Abor, of course, is regarded as the father of Philippine wildlife conservation, prominent Filipino zoologist. I'm not going to talk about the entire story of Abor, it's going to take another hour. Actually, Professor Dance actually did an, a similar talk all about Dr. Abor. It took him an hour and a half. So I'm going to do the excerpt, just a bit of uh, the story of Dr. Abor. So, of course, um, he did a study with. Uh, Dylan Ripley in Yale. Um, he went to all of 50 expeditions around the Philippines. There's a lot of those specimens were recollected, most of which were lost during the war. Um, eight species and 61 subspecies were named from the reward collections, including 87, which he authored. And one important picture there is the, um, the Negros fruit dove, the single specimen of the Negros fruit dove, uh, still kept in the Yale Peabody Museum. Of course, two species there in the middle, um, named after Dr. Rabor, which is Rabdornis Rabori, and then the Pothera Rabori, now of course, Robsonius Rabori. Culminating with all his work across the Philippines, he published several books, including the Monument of Philippine Birds and Mammals, another version of which he published with UP. Um, but one important publication he did was uh, about the birds of Cebu, which highlights the extinction of the Cebu flower pecker, the, Oriole and the leafer, which I've already mentioned by uh, Christian earlier. So that kind of uh, alerted a lot of people in terms of the problems uh, of deforestation. Then also adding a campaign on the endangered status of the Philippine eagle. He actually left the message at a popular film called To Live and Be Free about the Philippine eagle. So it kind of marks the start of awareness in terms of conserving Philippine birds. Alongside that, he also worked with illustrators, uh, including that of uh, Porfido Castaneda, and were some of those illustrators in the, his books in Philippine Birds and Mammals. His many uh, collaborations, of course, I'll pick out two of them, um, Dylan Ripley and Austin Rand. Um, of course, they've described a lot of species, including the ones here, uh, Cinnamon Ivon, Yellowwich Bulbo, again, both subspecies, jungle flycatcher. And then of course you have the red-eared parrot finch uh, in this beautiful illustration there of the mineral parent finch, Negus fruit dove, the whiskered flower pecker, the Negus striped babbler, the beagle ground babbler, and the cordillera ground horse named after the board. Another collaborator he had was of course, uh, John Eleutherian de Pont, um, which of course led with, uh, with the publication of a book called Philippine Birds. Uh, DuPont, actually, Rabor worked a lot on this book, uh, but of course, it's 
DuPont's uh, baby. So he is the sole author. Um, he, um, for us who worked with and used, because this is all before the Kennedy Guide, this was the field guide. So we called it the heaviest field guide ever. But it's still indispensable reference you bring on the field. Of course, John DuPont was an American ornithologist um, and also um, a sports enthusiast, um, worked with the Delaware Museum of Natural History. There's a long excerpt about the foreword of the book by Dean Amadon, I'm not gonna read that, but it includes around 510 species and subspecies, which I think was important because of the descriptions of subspecies that you use in the field. And if you wanna know the biography and the story about DuPont, you can watch the movie Foxcatcher. Another Filipino famous ornithologist is Pedro C. Gonzalez, a Filipino naturalist conservationist. He's the, was the head of the Zoology Division of the National Museum. Of course, again, multiple collaborations um, published in books of the birds of Cotanwanes and the birds of the Philippines with culinaries published by Haribon. Of course, he was part of the monumental book on the Kennedy Guide, um, described two species, uh, one named after Robor's wife, Lina Sunberg, and the Panay Strike after. Of course, this book is not a complete set. It's 129 species, often arranged by habitat. Um, another uh, collaboration was then with uh, Elliot McClure with the US, Arm, uh, US Army on the Migratory Animal Pathological Survey, which I think is very timely. It kind of represents what were problems were happening now in terms of zoonosis. So it was actually together with uh, Godofredo Alcasi, who took care of the Northern Philippines, and Dr. Robor, who took care of Southern Philippines. So this is about bird banding and collecting um, um, ectoparasites from birds to determine what particular diseases uh, uh, are carried um, and sort of like a zoonotic study. So both primate and birds, I suppose you with bats, and about different locations all around East Asia from Japan, to China, Taiwan, and Malaysia. Um, from 20 countries, they banded almost about a million birds and 1,216 species. Of course, um, from the Philippines, uh, on a big um, study across uh, the different islands. And now we, towards the end of that, that particular, go to two different sets of millennia because it's both uh, the end of the second millennia and then going towards the third millennia. So modern taxonomy has changed a lot because of the advent of uh, molecular studies. 1990 actually sparked the first studies on uh, genetics in birds by Sibley Monroe, which changed a lot of our understanding about birds. Actually includes one of the, spec uh, the species or uh, feel like the Rufus hornbill was part of the list. Uh, although at that time, it, um, we haven't actually added in the changes in the taxonomy in the Birds of the Philippines checklist. It still followed the traditional Peter's Guide, um, but still a very comprehensive account of the species reported in the Philippines. It's a precursor to the field guide. Um, and of course, uh, an important step beyond the point to increase important information about biogeography, taxonomy, history, distribution, it includes 556 species, but still, I don't know why it's colored fuchsia. But nonetheless, it's what I kind of call a Bible for Filipino ornithology. Again, uh, the, headed by uh, Edward Dickinson, um, Robert Kennedy, and Kenneth Parks. With that development of the list, they then had the plates done. And in 2000, finally, we had the first official field guide to the birds of the Philippines. Most of the countries around the Philippines had so many field guides, but this would be kind of the first complete set. And, for me, it actually is a catalyst for encouraging a lot more bird surveys, also a catalyst for bird watching. And of course, uh, it includes about 572 species. Um, Dr. Kennedy, Dickinson, uh, late uh, Tim Fisher, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, and uh, my teacher, also from UPL, from, from UPLB, Dr. Miranda, um, authored this monumental uh, book. So nowadays, with that change, I think it's the same set of paradigm shifts that we have experiencing in the third millennia, where we have a lot of innovative methods, a lot of exploration that continues because of the change, and of course, the usefulness of collections in the museum. So we'll go through the, those sets of series 
um, in the succeeding slides quickly. Um, so one is safeguarding our natural heritage. So museums now work um, are important um, areas for uh, knowledge because they have provide the historical and the heritage samples. Um, we have digitization now, which it's important for looking to distributions. Um, also because most of the collection, the new collections are done comprehensively. You do the specimen, photography, genetics, everything is kind of more comprehensive. So it's not very simple now for the new explorers. Then you just collect a specimen. Now you have to collect tissues, to do, uh, collect it properly, the private mes mes uh, measurements, uh, get the digital photography and so on and so forth. So it's not as simple as it is. Another set of new, ex new ex explorers are, of course, what we think as the people using citizen science, the bird watchers, the bird vendors, and the bird photographers. And they're all recording a lot of the birds in the wild and provide, and most of that data is now well curated. Um, and of course, a lot of it, um, events actually help develop them through bird counts, bird races, improving the list of birds around the Philippines. So for me, those are the new explorers. Again, there are also regular expeditions um, often done by universities and museums, often in collaboration. Um, recently, a lot of species have been collected. Of course, a lot of new additional species added to the Philippines, including these. So these I'm gonna look through the series uh, between 1990 and 2000, you have three species added. Of course, there was that kind of amazing collections in the in the early 1900s towards the late of the, the 20th century. A lot of species and subspecies were already described. So it kind of trickled down, fewer species are being discovered, but still in the Philippines, we still discovered new species. So three of which between that decade, Lena Sunbird, Panay Strike Babbler, and Pinsker's Hawk Eagle. On the next decade between 2000 to 10, another three species, the Bukidnon Woodcock and the Kalayan Rail, and of course the Kamigin Hanging Parrot, all of which sprang out from different expeditions. Uh, apart from that, again, as I mentioned with the museums, uh, now they also explore the collections and look into um, species limits and try to weed out uh, the species that were put together during the age of lumpers. We're now in the age of splitters. So a lot of these species are now being split again into an elevated to full species. So a lot of the scops owl, the flame backs, the broad bills, and the trichotron thrombus were now recognized as separate species. From 2010, of course, the present, there are three additional species, uh, two hawk owls from Kamigin and from Cebu, and of course, the Shera Madre ground there, which changed the genus of Nepothera to Ropsonius. Uh, again, another lot of these taxonomic splits um, from the blue back parrots now split, Rufus hornbills are split, the silvery kingfishers are split, the dwarf forest kingfisher, the Filipino hawk balls in itself were all split together from the Philippines, a lot of flower peckers and sunbirds. It's very hard to keep up and we're very lucky because people like Chris, Christian who works with the, uh, the records committee helps look into all these changes, all these taxonomic flux and puts it all together for us in a, in a final checklist at the end of the year. And with that, it's not just the taxonomy list, but also the added country records that were, of course, um, recorded by bird watchers as well as uh, uh, researchers. Um, in the past 20 years, two decades, about more than 70, almost 80 species have been added to the list, um, which are not new species. There are often um, vagrant or migratory species for residents with extra limited distribution. Um, a lot of them are accidental to the Philippines, mostly due to the typhoons. But I think the reason here, uh, I think as, as Chris also pointed out, it's largely due because there's a lot more observers, more bird watchers, more bird photographers who have access to more affordable equipment, travel and social media that they were able to record as much of the species around the Philippines than 20 years ago, because there were fewer eyes, there were fewer people. Now there's a lot more eyes. To, to jot down and find these interesting uh, new records or new country records to the Philippines. And to end it up with 2021, the most recent addition to our list is the hooded crane, which of course was um, um, observed in Shargao Island. 
uh, there's another set of about 15 or 20 more species, 15 from Batanes alone from 2018 to 2020. Um, so Batanes more or less is another area for, to, to watch out for in your country records. And with uh, the Kennedy Guide being 20 years old, a new uh, guide has come up, uh, published by uh, uh, Links Ediciones with uh, BirdLife International. So this is part of the uh, field guide collection uh, called also named Bird of the Philippines, authored by our friend Desmond Allen. It is an, uh, an amazing collection of 726 species. Um, looking also into the subspecies, which is important in the field. And it's more the up, most updated field guide that we have so far. So if you get a copy. Um, it also follows a taxonomy used by uh, HPW and bird life. So, and again, all these other um, important publications coming out. Uh, another one is on the uh, Philippine Red List. Um, you can get this for free, you can download it free at the BMBE library. It is a photo guide of the uh, current status of uh, the Philippine Red List on threatened fauna, including the, the vertebrates and the birds. Um, with that, we you can have all this access online um, of all the pictures, the images, the calls, in a way that you can also contribute and give back to these online databases. databases. And we think that it's exploration is not complete because you still have these future explorers. There's a lot of data gaps in the Philippines from genetics to videos of, of birds in the field, uh, calls, egg and nest documentation, uh, local names, microanatomy for forensics. So it's still a lot to do. And if you do see a bird that has not been listed in the Philippines before, always um, find Chris and submit it to the records or rarities committee. Um, of course, I'll e put the email uh, at the last part. And now I think it's time for us to look into all those conservation based uh, studies and, and try to evaluate. We need more data to help evaluate the status of our birds and, and be able to um, understand and conserve them better. And with that, uh, thank you very much for having the time. Uh, and be, I think um, you have uh, additional words, Chris. Any added words uh, from Chris? So I'd like to thank again the Consent Deal Committee, particularly the local organizing committee, our amazing team, our um, uh, moderators um, for this opportunity for us to share with you the 500 years of Philippine ornithology. And if you have any questions, you can always put us, this is our website and our emails. And again, if you do take pictures, always hashtag the following. With that, thank you very much. Uh, in behalf of Chris, again, thank you for the opportunity. And we hope you learned a lot. And I give you back to Mom Letty. Thank you very much for that very richly detailed and informative talk. Uh, it is truly very useful in giving us a good background of what we really had and what we continue to have and maybe have not yet discovered. And sadly, it also tells us of what we have lost you know, because there are a lot of what, according to Chris, there were a lot that were common and familiar just right in your backyard and now they are rare and critically endangered. Now let's open our panel uh, to question. If I was not heard at the first time, I would just have said thank you for that very rich and um, highly informative uh, shares, uh, JC and Chris. It gives us a very good idea of what we have around us very richly and what we have lost. But hopefully it gives us also new hope that there are still more to be found, if you would agree with me. And it would encourage us to have more ornithologists developing and uh, getting involved in this very good uh, area of research that we have. Can I have uh, questions from the audience, if there are? Question from Wilhelm Tan. What yes. happened to the quail found back in 2009? Okay. And second, 
do you feel that the conservation of birds in the Philippines has focused too much on the few birds like Philippine eagle? Is it a problem in your opinion? Okay, I will answer the first question. That picture of the Worcester's quail was taken uh, just after it was caught in the nets at uh, Dalton Pass, the nearby Sierra. It was, uh, there was a photographer there. He took the picture just after the bird was taken, after which it was put in a bag and uh, sent to the market to be sold and eaten. So the bird was probably eaten within a day after that picture was taken. Now that picture was uh, posted somewhere, on Facebook, maybe I'm not sure, by <clears throat> Arnel. And uh, weeks later, somebody else saw the picture. I think it was Desmond Allen, if I remember well. Saw the picture and said, wait a minute, what is this? Where did you take that picture? And it, uh, it was a Worcester's bottom quail. So in, in, a, in short, the bird was eaten very shortly after being photographed. For the second question, I think I will pass that to, uh, to JC. Um, yes, uh, the question is, do you feel that the conservation of birds in the Philippines has focused too much on a few birds like the Philippine eagle? And is it a problem in your opinion? No, not necessarily because uh, Philippine eagles are what we call flagship species. And also some of the flagship species are also keystone species. So they're important species in the habitat that can carry the habitat. And, and so if you do protect one species, you need to protect their habitat. You're also protecting all the other species associated with that habitat. So it's it's not because we're focusing just on a few species. Also, we need to focus with the Philippine eagle because it is our national emblem. But we also need to focus on other species that are have actually more in peril than the Philippine eagle. Like what um, Chris mentioned with the Cebu flower pecker. It was rediscovered in 1992. Um, I saw it in 1990. There was a video in 1996, um, but that was it. And, and, and very few, although people were still seeing it, but there's no evidence in terms of videos or pictures, hopefully not specimens, but yeah. So um, these are species which are probably less than 20 or less than, we don't know how much, because the last time it was recorded to have be less than 20, so. Um, yeah, there are other species which we need to focus on. So species-based conservation is important as long as they represent a habitat and you then help protect all the other species around it. Okay, I think we are pressed with time. We don't have much. I see some questions here, but I can only accommodate just one last. Um, uh, I would say sorry to Miss Yvonne Pikpikan for her question. I saw this anonymous attendee question first, and this will be the last so that we can have time for the other parts of the program. Are there any invasive species that are threatening our local bird biodiversity? Yeah. So um, in terms of alien species, we, I actually helped write the book, well, an article called Introduced Birds in the Philippines for this part of like a symposium. Uh, there are several species of birds which we recognize as introduced and have established in the Philippines, but most of them don't have a significant, they're quite small populations apart from the gorion, which is the tree sparrow. But the tree yeah. sparrow being found in human habitation kind of has very little impact on the natural species in the forest. So as long as they stay in the habitation areas, then they might, again, there's not much studies in terms of their impact. Like for example, remember Chris, they, we found them in um, Tubataha, which is amazing far away distribution and, and, and just a, a dispersal from the original Luzon to, to almost every island in the Philippines. So at the moment, it has an impact on industry and agriculture, but to other birds, there is not much studies done. So I would at the moment say, we don't know. I'm given a, uh, an instruction here. We can allow additional questions. So let me see. Um, an, another anonymous attendee, good morning. Are sunbirds the same with hummingbirds? How can we conserve them? I see sunbirds here in Los Manos, but no know how to help in their conservation. Thank you. To do nothing, just observe them, not interfere with their uh, life, not feed them. Um, if they are in a habitat that is not being destroyed by uh, humans, 
just let them be. If they are in a habitat that is being destroyed, then you could try to do something to protect that habitat, whether it's a forest or wetland or, or something else. Let them be. Thank you for that, please. Yeah, I raised this question in behalf of the rest of other uh, possible people who are who took, who are thinking to consider ornithologists. How will you encourage people who are interested to be ornithologists but seem to not know how to start? Is it livelihood friendly? Am I going to live as a an ornithologist? Can I sustain my family as an ornithologist if I want to study ornithology in the Philippines? You see. <laughs> um, as a career, I think there's um, very limited in terms of uh, positions that we can call ornithologists. Of course, you can be um, working for someone else or another job, but then use bird watching as your hobby, which is still uh, quite an important hobby because you also provide the information uh, through citizen science. But as an ornithologist, um, um, there is, of course, still a need for ornithologists. There are several universities and museums being put up, which, of course, can hire ornithologists, as well as um, the government, because they have monitoring programs, such as VMS, uh, in the different protected areas. So, yes, there is a need for them. I'm not sure if you're going to be rich about it, unless, um, just like what um, Chris mentioned about the plates, those wonderful plates, a lot of those, including Lozano's plates, are now actually fetching a lot of money in different, um, um, what do you call this? Uh, like so, Leading so, areas. Leading areas, areas or auction yeah. areas. Auction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a question in here. Yeah, Chris, yeah. you want to answer that question? Thank you for that answer. Um, maybe they should find some connections of how they can support their ornithology uh, endeavors. Here a question for, from Paul Henrik Godjakruz. Can you recommend areas or locations which merits further ornithological surveys? Thank you. Uh, did you get that? Can you recommend areas or locations which merits further ornithological surveys from Paul Henrik Godjakros. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Yes, there's a lot of areas in the Philippines. We have 7,600 islands. So, we have 500 islands in the shift. Bakayon would be a good place to look. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot of um, forests and mountain areas, especially with mountain, mountain ecosystems, uh, we need to look into, especially because we don't have the time to start up, especially areas that are kind of steep. In. Um, inaccessible, but nowadays a lot of changes in terms of uh, security and accessibility. So there would be now opening areas um, for study. Another one which we kind of take for granted is um, structure, um, uh, stratification. So we, often we do studies in the forest, you're always on the ground, but you never studied it from the top. So there's kind of a different perspective when you're in the canopy. So. Um, again, it's always a different habitat, habitat type, or another island, another mountain. There's a lot of choices to do so. And even with non-forest habitats, from grasslands to coastal areas to islands, there's always something to study. Yeah, OK. Um, one last question. I don't know how, who, who to choose. But uh, yes, let me read this from Dr. Victor Tixon. Uh, congratulations to JC and Christian. I would like to ask, what is the most urgent work that needs to be done in the field of Philippine ornithology? What is the gap? Christian? You have to leave that to you. Okay. <laughs> so our biggest problem at the moment is consolidating a global standard checklist. Because of, there's always a difference in terms of um, acceptance of uh, the species, because there's now there's a taxonomic flux. There's a lot of species being split, a lot of species um, still being discovered, um, whether the changes are adopted by one checklist or not. So there's actually four, four check, five checklists kind of going around globally. So um, w, uh, Wild Bird Club is following IOC, I think still, but we're recommending the book 
Birds of the Philippines, which is HBW, which is a different list. And then we're using eBird, which is Clemens, which is another list. And then you also have, um, what's the other one? Um, Howard and Moore. So sort of kind of having an integrated checklist would help put things together into one standard. For us, that's one thing I could think of as a problem. Okay. Um, there are two questions. Again, again, this is last, last night. Um, there seems to be good uh, contributions to Philippine uh, ornithology from Spanish to French to Japanese, British, American, and Filipino. Uh, which among these would you deem the best uh, contributors? And, and although it seems that it was ornithological studies have been dominated by foreign people, what should the government do to boost Filipinos into ornithology? Chris, any suggestions? Mm -hmm. Well, to the question, who was the best contributor? I think all the contributors from all these countries that you have listed, they, they, all, uh, they were all very valuable contributions and they uh, uh, just built up on previous knowledge to add to the knowledge to, uh, to reach where we are now, where the, the knowledge of Philippine uh, birds is really a good amount of information is incredible. Now about what the government should do, the Philippine government, I would love to leave that to, uh, to Jesse on that part of the question. <laughs> so I think the government is doing a lot of uh, contributions with it. Um, there are uh, a lot of support in terms of DNR going with the um, support on uh, protecting uh, birds and wild as well as for um, countering illegal trade. Um, they're supporting the um, evaluation of the different um, protected areas. So there's like the BMS. And also we remember um, um, that you were part of all the different um, trainings that we had for the different DNR uh, yes. personnel, um, development of a lot of um, books actually and, and literature that's actually free online, including the red, the, the, the red list. So uh, it's actually quite a good time in terms of how the government actually responds. I always think something else is new and something is still needed. But if you compare it, say, 20, 30 years ago, there's a lot of contributions. Now, even with the different other departments, uh, the OST, um, DOT, actually remember there was a time that DOT supported bird watching and published a lot of books. Um, actually, it was there in the UK, in the UK Bird Fair. It's amazing uh, support for promoting um, bird watching in the Philippines. Um, it was quite overwhelming. Um, and uh, with the DOS, going into the different studies, um, even the basic sciences, and now looking into applied sciences and molecular, um, it's a lot of, so there's a lot of interest and support. So it's just a matter of us tapping that particular resource and connecting and collaborating um, with the government in terms of um, doing all the, the things that we need to conserve or protect. Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah. Um... So the certificate is coming in, but for all those questions that we still have, a lot came in uh, after I said, uh, I'd read the last question, but there is really no time. Just put your questions there and uh, the m &H will try to give them to our uh, presenters today so that they can be quite, quite uh, answered uh, online or through email. No? So thank you once again for that great uh, discussion. Uh, to show our gratitude for your talk, I'm presenting to you both this electronic certificate of recognition signed by our director, Marian P. De Leon. Um, let me read, Museum of Natural History, uh, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Certificate of recognition is awarded to Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez, for serving as a resource person during the 2021 MH Baliktanao Kasaysayan at Kalikasan webinar series, 500 Years of Ornithological Explorations in the Philippines, held on June 2, 2021, 10 a.m. to 11.30 via Zoom. In witness whereof, the signature of our beloved director, Dr. Marian De Leon, is here. 
and also for Dr. Uh, Mr. Christian Perez, the same um, text is written here and this is his uh, certificate. So once again, in behalf of MNH, we really, really give you our highest level of appreciation and gratitude for opening our minds to the very rich history of ornithological explorations in the Philippines for the past 500 years and giving us a good perspective of what will come in the future, making us proud we are Filipinos in a very rich ornithological ecosystem and environment. Uh, um, yes, uh, may I call on the MC, please? Okay, thank you, Ma'am Letty. Uh, before we end the webinar, allow me to give out a few reminders. Please evaluate the seminar to get the certificate of participation. The link is flashed on the screen and copied in the chat box of Zoom and the comments area of our YouTube live post. Just click on the link provided so that you can evaluate after the webinar. Responses will be accepted until 3 p.m. only. We thank the following organizations and people for all the support, resources, and inspiration. Finally, please follow UPLB Museum on social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Let us now all take a break. We hope to see you in our next seminar to be delivered by Dr. Leticia E. F. Puang on June 16, 2021 on Herpetofaunal Studies in the Philippines, a recall. Please make sure uh, you log out of Zoom for security purposes. And thank you and goodbye. Keep safe, everyone. <laughs>